Well, welcome. You guys doing good? Okay. You look good? Sound good? Smell good? That's half the battle right there. At least that's what I tell my children. Um, I want to say welcome to Refuge. If today is your first time with us, you're new with us, then um, it's an honor that you're here. Um, at the end of the service, you have an opportunity to uh, give us uh, some information, fill out a Connect card, and it can turn into guest services. If you're right across a, the hallway, you notice we've been changing some things over the past few weeks. Uh, that's okay. All right. Willie didn't know. <laughs> Help me God today. Uh, so... Let me get right into the word. <laughs> I got a lot to cover. If you noticed in your guide, um, there's two chapters on there. That's actually a lie, Exodus 24, 25. We're actually going to cover about 13 chapters. And uh, I promise you, the first service was only like 25, 30 minutes. I'm not lying. Okay? <laughs> promise. Uh, it may be about more than that here. Um, so if you have a Bible, grab it. And we'll be in Exodus chapter 24. Um, <laughs> So, so what we've been doing is been going through the book of Exodus, and this is God delivering his people, using a, uh, coming to a man um, who didn't ask for any of this, named Moses. God using Moses and telling Moses, you're, you're going to go do this. You're going to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Uh, Moses then goes out to, um, to Pharaoh and, and tells him that the word of the Lord says, let my people go. After a little disgruntled uh, fight, uh, between Moses and, uh, I don't want to call it a fight because it seems like that the enemy would have the upper hand. He never did. Uh, but finally, in his blatant uh, refusal to let him go, God just kind of unleashed uh, his wrath. And so what happened is, is that uh, Pharaoh let his people go, let the Israelites go. They, they turn with their backs against the Red Sea. God displays his great power by demolishing the enemy and by crushing the greatest known empire in this time, in this army. And so God leads them out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, into the wilderness. And about a year into their journey, they get to Mount Sinai, which is where we've been for the past month. Mount Sinai is where God reveals himself to his people, gives them the Ten Commandments, which is what we've been talking about. I don't know if I just set somebody's Siri off or something by something I said. Um, anyway, and so he let them Ten Commandments. He let them uh, reveal himself. This is how you respond to me. This is how you respond to people. And so about as few chapters into that, he lets out like 600 plus commands to his people. And right after that, this is God going to seal his covenant with his people. And so this is going to be kind of awkward in this first part of this chapter because it's going to be uh, something that you would kind of feel like. Maybe this is on some weird horror movie that you would experience something like this. I promise uh, it'll all make sense, uh, hopefully, in the end. Okay, so Exodus chapter 24. I'm going to read just a few verses and then just kind of talk about what's happening and then we'll get right back into um, uh, what the Word of God. So this is the Word of the Lord. Exodus 24, verse 1. Then he said to Moses, Go up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, um, and seventy of Israel's elders, and bow in worship at a distance. Moses alone in his approach, the Lord, but the others are not to approach. Gazutai. And the people are not to go up with him. Moses came and told the people all the commands of the Lord and all their ordinances. Then all the people responded with a single voice, We will do everything that the Lord has commanded. And there's a lot of irony in that. Yeah. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, and he rose early the next morning and set up an altar with 12 pillars in the 12 tribes of Israel at the base of the mountain. Then he sent out young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed bulls as a fellowship offering to the Lord. Moses took half the blood and set it in basins. The other half of the blood, he splattered it on the altar. And then he took the covenant scroll and read it out loud to the people, and they responded again. We will do all and obey all that the Lord has commanded. I don't know if it was like that, but in my mind, that's how it works. Moses took the blood. Moses took the blood, splattered it, 
on the people and said, this is the blood of covenant of the Lord made with you and all concerning all these words. Now, this is interesting. Um, at this point, God has revealed himself through his voice and through the bright, consuming fire, smoke billowing from the mountain to what we know of about 1.5 million people. God has spoke and drawn Moses in one person that he takes a couple of people with Aaron and he also reveals himself to 70 of the elders which is to let us know that God is yet again wanting to display to the world that he is not a God of just one person but he is a God who wants to reveal himself to all people. That is critical for our conversation today. God wants to reveal himself to all people. So he reveals them the law. Moses comes out. He reads all these commands to them. They respond with this claim of we will do all that you have commanded us to do. Isn't that interesting? Now, God is sealing the ceremony of a covenant with his people. Okay. Now, a covenant is different than a contract. A covenant says, I'll do my part. Even if you don't do your part, I will still do what I said I would do. This is not a contract. A contract says, if you don't do what you say you were going to do, then I can get out of this writing or this command or this contract here. Okay. So God is sealing this covenant. That's important because, as you know, these people have this spiritual dementia and forget that they just said, we will do all that you said we would do. We're commanded. In less than a couple weeks, where are they at? At the bottom of the mountain, making golden idols in the form of a cow. Chick-fil-A said amen right there. <laughs> um, orgies and all these weird things going on. Well, we thought Moses left us. We, got, we thought God left us. But they just said something that sealed the covenant with them, but is just the tendency of all mankind, tendency of all of us, starts with good intentions. Now, I've seen this in church um, all, pretty much all my life, and I've seen it really specifically as a pastor in this church, that um, people start here with good intentions. And typically those people that start with good intentions will let you know how much they love you. you know, they'll let you know how much this church means. Man, I'll scrub them toilets. I'll wipe them booties. I'll do whatever. We just love refuge. I just love you, Matthew. We just love that worship. And when they start singing those songs, mm, my soul, I just feel like I'm one with the Lord. I'm communing, right? And you get all charismatic on us. And then, like, just within a few weeks later, something is said. Something is done. You get, you're uh, something in a wad. And, and so you're just like, I ain't going to go there anymore. And it started with a good intention. It reminds me of when Jesus was riding on the donkey. You know, when he's coming in, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and all the people are like, Hosanna in the highest. <sighs> and they're, I don't know what's up with the sound effects today. Um, they're, <laughs> they're praising. And then like one week later, I don't know if it's all of them, but I'm sure some of them were in the crowd. They're like, kill this guy. Because it all started with a good intention, right? Okay. So here they are, God revealing himself to his people. Revealing himself to these millions of people down to just one person. Spreading the method of operation that God wants to reveal himself to all people. Now, if you continue to read, something interesting happens in verse 9. And Moses went up to Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 Israel. I just, I want that name. Abihu, that's pretty cool. No, not Aaron. 
Kind of got a bad connotation with it. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I be who, yeah, that's, that's like a, you know, I be who, I be you. You know, like, that's like, that's Hughley talk. I don't, it's right here in the Bible. And 70 of Israel's elders, I don't know why I do that. Just pray for me. And listen to this verse. I have it bolded and underlined in my iPad. They saw God, they saw the God of Israel. Beneath, this is like straight out of a sci-fi movie. Beneath his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli as clear as the sky itself. God did not harm the Israelites, the Israelite nobles. They saw him and they ate and drank. Now, I, I want to pause there because this is worth mentioning. I didn't think according to the Bible, that you could see God. Okay. All right? And that's, this is kind of interesting. I, because no man has seen the face of God. I mean, you, you will crumble. You will, you will be zapped into an abyss. I mean, this is the all power and glory that demands that nobody can see the face of God. But here in the Bible, what are they doing? They saw God, and they're eating, and they're drinking with him. I don't know if it's milk, wine, whatever. I'm sure it was something good, right? Yeah. They're, they're camping out with them. And here's what God is doing. God's like, I'm going to step out of the cosmos. And I'm sure, like, in my mind's eye, he's telling all of his hosts, he's like, hey, guys, I'm going to go do something. I'm going to go, I'm going to go camping with my boys down there. Uh-oh. Now, two thoughts to what they saw. One, uh, one of these words that they saw God, uh, it literally could translate as vision. So they just, perhaps they just saw a vision, what was like God. But another way to look at this is that in the luminous light, the faint, adumbrated person, there sat with him, okay. Jesus, camping with him yeah. and dining with him, feathering the message of God that I've no longer came just to be in covenant with you. I'm coming to dwell with you. Amen. All right, so check this out now. Here we go. Verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay there, so that I might give you the stone tablets with the law and commandments I've written for their instruction. So Moses arose with his assistant, Joshua, went upon the mountain of God. He told the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. Aaron and her are here with you. Not her as in a girl, but her, that's his name. Um, Whoever has a dispute should go to them. We see how that turns out, too. When Moses went up the mountain, the cloud covered it, right? The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses. I don't know if you guys are seeing these numbers. It's crazy how God works this stuff out. On the seventh day, he called up to Moses from the cloud, and the appearance of the Lord's glory to the Israelites was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. (laughs) This is funny again. Moses entered the cloud as he went up to the mountain, and he remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, God wants everybody to see this. Now, this is just my introductory remarks. I'll get into the real part of my message in just a moment. So I want you to notice, here's what God is doing. God creates a covenant with his people because he wants to dwell with his people. And so here... For 40 days, God is about to give Moses instructions in how to enter into the presence of the living God. Amen. Now, this is, um, this is something that I just can't fathom. God can spend six days to create heaven and earth, but he's going to spend 40 days describing how to enter into his presence. So for the next 13 chapters, he gives a detailed look 
a blueprint, so to speak, on what it means and how to go into the presence of God. And I need you to understand this because this is critical. He spends more time within the book of Exodus alone in this. In fact, this is probably the most critical part of the story. 13 to 15 chapters of how to get into the presence of God in the book of Exodus. Just a couple of chapters calling Moses. 13 to 15 chapters of how to get into his presence. Just a few chapters of his interaction with Pharaoh and them leaving Exodus leaving Egypt. 15 chapters, you see where I'm going with this? A third of Exodus dedicated, more than the law, more than any other topic found in Exodus. In fact, a couple other books that precedes Exodus, in total, we will get 50 chapters that details for the people of Israel in how to get into the presence of God. This is God sealing his covenant with his people and letting them understand, now what does it mean to get into my presence? I mean, check this out, y'all. It's like a laundry list. So he tells them, like, okay, uh, you're going to have this Ark of the Covenant. All right, it's going to be made of this type of stuff. There's going to be like these cherubim angels. They're going to be covering over it and on top of it. You're not going to call it a seat of judgment. You're going to call it a seat of mercy. Amen. Amen. You've got the Ark of the Covenant. Then you have like this mercy seat where the presence of God will actually tangibly meet them. Then you have the tabernacle, which is the base of what the conversation is about. It's going to be made of this wood. You're going to have all these fine details to it. And it's going to be a tent. And then on top of that, you're going to have a golden lampstand. You're going to have ten curtains. Some of you who are seamstress got really pumped up. <laughs> you're like, yes! Yeah. My calling has been fulfilled by making these curtains for the temple of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God. Right? I just went totally Methodist on all of you. You didn't see that coming. Like, here's how you make these drapes. They're going to be of this material, goat hair. This is awkward. Why? I don't know. But it's like this long Home Depot laundry list of what to do. In fact, I would further this and say, if you want to know what my life is like right now, renovating a house, read Exodus chapter 23 through 40. Very detailed, and God is very into the details here. Curtains, bronze altar, oil for the lamp, the priest's garments, the consecration of the priest, the oils and the altar of incense, the bronze brazen, the incense, and all of these fine details and all of the creative and artistic people in the room are reading this and saying yes and amen. amen. God is into the details. He's got this excellent way of doing things. And so God is saying that here I want to seal my covenant with my people because I want to dwell with my people. Amen. And here's how you dwell with my people. Yeah. He spends all of this time telling them about the tabernacle. Okay. Tabernacle. This Hebrew word is mishka, which means to dwell but here is God saying, I've sealed my covenant and my promise with my people. And now I've come to dwell because I no longer want you to think that I'm some God that's hiding behind the cosmos. This is what God is doing. God is, and I'm going to use this word. It may not be a word, but I'm, I'm a preacher. I can make up words. He is re, re-edonizing, right? I'll explain. Hold on. He is re-Edenizing. So remember Eden, right? In Genesis, fall came. And God is saying, I want, this is where God's presence walked and talked with Adam and Eve. But then sin came in, destroyed it. Destroyed 
Eden in a moment. In fact, you can see the tabernacle and glimpses of the tabernacle in Genesis 2. Some of the same type of elements are found in the garden that were used in the tabernacle. When sin came into the garden of Eden, you know who came and guarded the garden of Eden? Two cherubims with flaming swords. Yeah. And now two cherubims are covering and guarding the presence yeah. of God. God is saying, that which was lost, that daily communion that you once had with me, that sin thought that it stole from humanity, I'm coming to reestablish my presence with my people. So God here, in essence, is saying that which was lost in the Garden of Eden, I've come to reestablish that by my tabernacle because I've come that I may dwell with my people. But again, it has terms and it has a lot of conditions. Amen. You don't just go in there flippantly. You just don't go into the Holy of Holies any way you want to. Okay. God is holy and he demands our fear and reverence. So he said, okay, then I'll only set aside the deepest layer of the Holy of Holies for my high priest. And even them, they had to be cleansed. They had to set up and make atonement for their sins and cleanse themselves before they could even enter into the temple. So you had this outer court, which all the sacrifices took place, and then you inside you had this inner court. The tent of meetings is what other books would call it. And this is used transferably. When you talk about the tabernacle, it's also the tent of meetings where God came and dwelled with his people. <laughs> this is the tabernacle of God that he wants to reestablish, that sin took away. And so I'm coming back to reestablish a promise that I want to dwell with my people. I'm not just some God it's playing hide-and-go-seek that you don't okay. know. Remember, I spoke to 1.5 million people, the children of Israel. I spoke to Moses. I spoke to um, the Aaron and the two boys. I spoke to the 70 elders. This is not a God who is in private, who has set aside his glory for just one person. This relationship, this glory of God is not just set aside for one person. Like some religions would want you to think that, like, I've got this new divine revelation and I'm going to go behind and read these stones and, and, and transcribe this, this, Egyptian, uh, uh, this Egyptian writing. And, and so I, the only revelation is only for me. No, that's not what God wanted to communicate to his people. I want to reveal myself to all people. And he does that by establishing the tabernacle, the mishkan, the, the dwelling of God with his people, but then there's a problem because then the tabernacle, the tent, which solves two problems, by the way. Now the people have access to God, and it's also portable because, you know, as the rest of the story, this is only year one into their journey. They got 39 more years, so they got to move this thing around. So this is not something that's static and has to stay in one location. This is the temple of God, the tent of God. God camping out and saying, hey, wherever you go, take me with you because I'll be there. Until 39 years later, they get established in the promised land. Some years after that, they erect the temple of God. So now from the tent, moves into a temple, but then the temple is destroyed. Then it's re-erected, but then something <coughs> happens to the temple. Because Jesus would say that something happened to the temple where it got perverted, right? Jesus says, um, he, he comes in, I don't know if you remember the story in the Gospels where Jesus comes in, he turns tables uh, and, a, and a microphone where it's at, you, you, nobody remembers that song, two turntables and a microphone, uh, not like the DJ, uh, but he comes in, I mean, he's like flipping, he's got his whip, he's like whipping things out, and there's a problem because the temple, the tabernacle, the dwelling of God, the Mishkan of God, where his presence dwells, had turned into a mall and a strip joint. And now because it had turned into this target, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, can no longer have access to the dwelling of God. 
So then where was the dwelling of God? Where was this Mishkan? Where was this tent? This presence of the living God? John 1, 14 answers it when he says, Kaya Lagos, Sarks Echinito, Kai Eska Nusen, and Haman, which is Greek for, and the word became flesh, and here it is, and dwelt among us. Now this word, Eskinusen, is the Greek word that literally translates as pitch a tent among the people. So here's Jesus coming and saying, that which was lost in the Garden of Eden, that which was perverted in the tabernacle and destroyed in the temple, I've come to reestablish my presence with my people in the form of God incarnate. And the Word became flesh, and he pitched a tent, and he dwelt among his people. Michigan with his people. He went camping. He said, you know, God ain't camping with y'all no more, but I've come to redeem that. Now, notice he doesn't say, the, the translation isn't, and he makes a mansion. Now, I don't own one. Let me side note this conversation that I'm about to have with you. But in my mind, if I did, the 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 what communicates for me, all right, all right, I'm bottom of the chain on the tax bracket, okay? It's just what it communicates to me. On the chain here is that if I have a mansion, you are not welcome here. I've got my laser guns aimed at the entrance. Not true. I've got some security cameras. I've got a gate and a rabid um, We'll go raccoon and dog, all right? I've got these rabid animals ready to pounce you, ready to keep you from getting into my mansion. Because this is my house. Okay. This is my place. I've worked hard for it. I've got all my valuables in it. I ain't got time for you to come up in here and take all my groceries. This is the mansion. This is bad theology when you say, well, I just bought my mansion in heaven. Because God didn't come to establish a mansion for us. And he's not a mansion for you. This is the same dwelling word that Jesus used in Revelation when he says that, Behold, a new heaven and a new earth, and God came and dwelled among the people. That the presence of God and the new heaven and the new earth is a tabernacle, a tent. Where he dwells. Yeah. And so it's not the mansion, so it's the tent. Now, a tent is very different. If you've gone camping, you know what a tent communicates. You're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. yeah. let, me, let me break it down like this to hurry. If I, if I pitched a tent in your yard, I wouldn't because that's weird. <laughs> just, just follow me here, okay? Do they have money? Right. <laughs> if I pitched a tent in my yard, you're going to see me. Can't go to the bathroom in my tent. If it gets hot, we'll be knocking on your door. Hey, can I borrow some of that air conditioner? How about a cold glass of water? I'm going to take a cold shower real quick. In the wintertime, here I am again. Hey, bro, it's cold and frail. I need some heat. What's going on? Can you borrow your blanket and bomb some stuff off of you? I mean, everywhere you go, there I am. There peeping out. My, I don't know if this is true or not, but this is what I would do in my mind. That creepy guy, like, just peeping out of my tent. I'm like, hey, dinner time? I'm, I'm coming. And as crazy as that sounds, this is what Christ came to do. That I came to pitch a tent in your yard so that, why? So that you can know me. You can't know him if he's shacked up in some mansion behind some cage where security keeps you from gaining access to him. He says, that's not who I am. I have come to dwell and to pitch a tent in your yard. And the word became flesh and tabernacled 
and pitched a tent and dwelled with us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 it says this, but Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle. I'm made with hands. This is not of this creation, but he entered the most sacred and holy place once and for all, not by the blood of goats and calves and bulls, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. So here's Jesus saying, I have fulfilled all that was about the tabernacle, gaining access to it from actually being into the holy most place of the tabernacle. I have fulfilled that. And now to have access, you go through me, Jesus. Hebrews 4, 16 would say that now we can go boldly before the throne of grace, having access to the Father. Because Jesus came flesh and dwelled among us. But then there's another problem, one that I'm sure Moses couldn't fathom at this point, that he was setting the stage. And the children of Israel, I'm sure, were, couldn't fathom all of this, that they were setting the stage for Christ to come and to dwell among the people. But then Christ came, and then Christ ascended, and then Christ now sits at the right hand of the Father. So my question is now, where is the presence of God? Where is the tabernacle? Where is the dwelling of God? Where is the tent of God? Paul asked the same question. And he answers it in 1 Corinthians to the church of Corinth, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. He says, do you yourselves not know that you are the temple, the tabernacle Amen. of God? <laughs> Let me say that one more time. Like, do you not, you yourselves realize to the church, he's talking to the church, that you now are that embodiment of the presence of God. Who is? The church is. Amen. Where is the presence of the living God? He's not ascended and just left us. He's not just going camping and say, all right, boys, take care of yourselves. I'll see you on the other side. It's not behind this cosmic scene of hide and go seek. Now the presence of God dwells and lives inside in tabernacles and pitches a tent within his people, the church. And now, what was lost in Eden, restored via the tabernacle, then gained through the temple, then lost through the temple, then gained back through Christ Jesus, now Christ has breathed the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and to some people who didn't earn it, didn't deserve it, didn't even know it was coming, just a bunch of no good for nothing people. And he said, now I will tabernacle, I will dwell, and I'll pitch my tent among my people, Amen. the church. Amen. And herein lies where the presence of God is, Amen. where you and I reside. Yes. So the presence of God is here now. It's not something that we have to go and go, oh, God, we begged for you to come. We begged for you to move. We begged for you to show up. God's like, you don't do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm inside of you. Yeah. You have access. I am dwelling. I'm pitching my tent. And the embodiment of the living God in his presence is inside you and I. Yeah. Not just in one individual. Okay. But now to a whole group of people who are part of the church. The tabernacle, the dwelling of God, came and pitched a tent right here in hot and muggy West Point, Georgia. Amen. Through some people called Refuge. 
and then some other churches, and then some other people who are gathering in homes, and then some people who are gathering in China, and all over the world. God's presence is active, and he's pitched a tent into his world through his church. Yeah. You just ask the question, though. That's heavy. That may have been a little deep. Didn't understand some of that Greek Hebrew. It's okay. Let me just ask you. What are you doing since you have the presence of God inside of you, the dwelling that's Canusan, the dwelling place of God. If you have that inside of you, then what are you doing with it? Okay. If that is the hope of the world, what are you doing with that? Okay. Let me pray. God, thank you that you, uh, in your sovereignty, has, you've chosen me and these people to dwell. Like, like before the foundations of the earth, you chose us to be that dwelling. I, Moses couldn't even fathom it that what he was doing was setting the stage for there to be a people thousands of years later to gather together to be the dwelling and the embodiment of the presence of God. And you're here. I pray that you help us, God, that we are carrying you. You help us in our in our urge to be holy. You help us, God, in our urge to carry this message of light to all nations. You, you help us to carry this dwelling, this tent, this tabernacle with us so that all nations and all people can hear the good news of the gospel, that you've come and the word came and dwelled among us.